Hello, this is John Jughead Pearson in Osaka, Japan, at now it is 2.35 a.m. And now, after four weeks of putting this off, I am going to uh, tackle Anthem for a New Tomorrow by Screeching Weasel. Um, I, I started doing a lot of studying on this one, and then I just kind of put it back in my mind for a while while I, uh, you know, worked here in Osaka and also did a lot of hiking and uh, almost died this weekend. Well, I didn't. And I didn't almost die, but, you know, when you're hiking in the mountains and it start, the sun starts setting and then you're lost and you don't know what path you're on, uh, you kind of feel like you're going to die. So I ran really fast and slid down a hill and uh, followed this water flowing downwards into a, a farm, a gated farm, climbed over the fence and uh, found my way back. So <laughs> I thought after that, uh, instead of running tonight and exercising, I thought I might try to tackle this anthem for a, two demo anthem for a new tomorrow, which for some reason uh, I have stalled in completing. Uh, maybe it's because it has, it has uh, always been seen as one of the best records, and uh, I always placed it a little bit lower. Um, maybe it's because it was the beginning of it becoming more of a uh, Ben project and less of a, an ensemble sort of work on it, even though Vapid had a lot of influence on this one, and we still were touring as a band, and uh, we work together on this record as a band. It's it 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 has the feelings of it beginning to uh, change, and um, uh, and also along with that, it's it's where Ben started really forming his idea of of concepts and and records as con as conceptual, uh, not really like a, you know a, a, a Jethro Tull. Uh, album like Aqualung or, or, you know, Pink Floyd's The Wall, but the idea that all songs are sort of a whole, uh, and this sort of took him more and more into creating songs and records on his own. Um, I think there's ways of bringing a band along with you on that, but uh, this was slowly moving towards away, that idea. Um, so maybe that has some something to do with that, why this has been a harder one to tackle and to sort of see uh, objectively, which I still haven't, and maybe by the end of going over this I will have more of an objective opinion, uh, or maybe more of a subjective opinion that uh, oversees the uh, the reason to have an objective opinion. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, Anthem for New Tomorrow, Anthem for a New Tomorrow, was recorded in May uh, on the 11th and 12th in 1993 at Sonic Iguana uh, Studio in Lafayette, Indiana, um, by Mass Giorgini, who was brought on board as our producer on uh, the album before this one, Wiggle. Um, Mass and I had had a relationship for a while before this. He actually called up to, to uh, for us to, to perform... Uh, uh, one of the first uh, Weasel shows outside of our own state um, because he had uh, heard our demo tape, so he wanted us to come to Lafayette and play with his band back then, which was Rat Tail Grenadier. Um, so we had been introduced a while ago, and then he had his own studio, and we went in there for uh, Wiggle, and uh, we had some trouble, but uh, we still believed in him as a producer, and then we went back um, for Anthem for a New Tomorrow. Um, uh, maybe I'll say this now. The, uh, the idea was uh, we would tour and we would get tight as a band and then we would start learning uh, the songs and then we would go into the studio with Mass and we would use that energy from touring and record the records. But we all got sick uh, to varying degrees and we actually were in the studio for that first day um, and it was pretty obvious that we were all not feeling very well and the songs weren't coming out so good. So we went home and, um, and came back a little bit later. 
I'm not sure if some more songs were written then or not, because a lot of these songs we weren't doing on that tour, which was our last tour. Um, the tour, which I'll probably get into, uh, was at the beginning, was with just Screeching Weasel, with me, Panic, uh, Vapid, and Ben. And we had our own van at this time, and we were touring with Richard, uh, Richard the Roadie, who we'd, we had met previously on our last tour in California. Um, and he was a great, a great guy, always covered in oil, and a um, very pleasant man who knew a lot about uh, vans and how to rebuild them, and also a, a lot about being diplomatic on tour, and sort of being a pit bull, sort of a, a guy for the band who stuck by the band. A really complicated, interesting, great guy. Um, so he was on this tour, and then we also hooked up with uh, Ben Hamper, who was the writer of the book uh, Rivet Head, who had got a relationship going with Ben um, via I think he met, Ben mentioned Ben Hamper in a Maximum Rock and Roll article, and then Ben Hamper uh, contacted Ben Weasel, and uh, we met him on that tour and also set up the idea that he would travel with us. So he was with us for about a week of that tour. And then we picked up uh, the Queers for the second half of the tour. Uh, we played a few shows with them in on the East Coast, and then they did the full half of the West Coast tour with us. Uh, it was kind of an interesting situation for us because we were normally just a four-week touring band because um, basically Ben didn't really want to be on the road any more than that. Uh, but this was a... Uh, from what I remember, a two, four-week session where we did four weeks, came home for a while, and then we went out for another four weeks. I remember this because uh, Richard uh, was staying with me at my place in Logan Square, which is where we would re we would rehearse a lot of our songs. We were re we were rehearsing at that time in my basement um, for both Wiggle and for Anthem for New Tomorrow. And and uh, what I remember of Richard is that he didn't watch TV at all. TV at all. Um, I, he kind of even, I think, lived on like the streets or in different random apartments when he lived in uh, California. Um, but he was riveted, riveted by the, uh, the TV. He was transfixed by it. And the whole time we were there for like one day or two days, maybe a couple days, um, he just didn't move. Every time I, I came home, I would look to him and he would just look up from the TV and wave at me and then go back to the TV. Uh, so it, it reminded me that, uh, that it is sort of a, the TV can be a wicked machine of attention. Because um, you'll see a little kid was also very attracted to the lights of a TV. A very dangerous little machine, the TV. Anyway, um, I'm getting way off track, but uh, let's see. Um, so it was recorded in Sonic Iguana, uh, except for the song Totally and Every Night, which um, were actually recorded in Sonic Iguana, but uh, we didn't like the, the way that they were sounding. Uh, ben especially just really didn't like the way that uh, those two songs uh, came out. And it might be because we we had previously recorded them uh, I'm pretty sure, and it says here, in February of 93 at Flat Iron, Flat Iron uh, Recording uh, Studio in Chicago with Mark Schwartz, who would later work with us on um, Bark Like a Dog. Uh, his studio was called uh, Flat Iron, and then it eventually became Uber Studios. Uh, so we recorded a couple songs with him, and uh, I just think we liked the sound of those better. They were a little bit more raw. And I think Ben was a little bit more comfortable with how he was singing. Now, maybe I'll get into that when we talk about those songs on the record. Um, so then it was eventually mixed at Art of Ears on July 27th and 28th in Hayward, California, by uh, Andy Ernst, uh, who is also known as uh, the producer of bands such as Green Day, AFI, Rancid, Swinging Utters, and Good Riddance. Um, so now I'm going to first read a, a thing I got from Master Genie. He wrote a couple uh, things. This is a long one, so uh, buckle in before we get into the songs. Um, I Once again, I want to state that uh, even more so as we get along, I'm a little un uncomfortable about talking specifically about lyrics because that's the, the realm of uh, Ben Weasel. 
and I am more comfortable with uh, discussing events that are that come to my mind after having reviewed and listened to the songs on the record. So you will hear very little about the meanings of each song, and I refer you to any articles uh, from Ben Weasel about about that stuff in order to get more of a an idea of where he was coming from lyrically. Um, so here's Mass's first thing he had to say about the record in general. Uh, he says, while the second location of Sanka Guana was far from perfect, uh, we recorded Wiggle at the first one, it did have an incredibly wide variety of possible recording rooms. All told, there were four complete floors of available space, including one with all the wood floors and brick walls and the slanted ceiling. The downside being that this one amazing floor was the fourth floor at the top of a rather rickety late 1800s building with no heat anywhere but the first two floors. At any rate, we recorded the instruments on the ground level, live, with the amplifiers separated into isolation while all the musicians wore headphones and played together in the same room. Um, this was kind of a big deal for us uh, back in uh, the first few records of that we recorded most of this stuff live and then did overdubs of, of solos and then uh, Ben and Vapid would do uh, vocal tracks uh, and get rid of their scratch vocals. Um, it was a big deal then and that's important because on Emo we sort of, uh, Ben and I had decided to try to get back to that sort of idea um, because music in general and us along with it were pulled into this way more heavily produced sound uh, where everyone would record separately and you would do it to a click track. Um, so these early records were not done that way. And uh, I think it's very important that Mass brought this up right here. And so it goes on. A uh, similar approach was taken with the vocal overdubs in that... Oh, in, in that Ben uh, sung his vocals in the main performance room of the main floor while Vapid sung his in the basement booth. Honestly, Mass says, the word booth may be overly generous. It consisted of makeshift sound foam walls, thinking by paper... Uh, for some reason, you know what? He's probably working on his iPad like I'm working on his iPad. One was working on my iPad a lot recently. And um, when you make a mistake, uh, an error in spelling, it changes it into a different word. So I'm going to stumble around here and try to correct those. Uh, it consisted of a makeshift sound foam walls, thinner, I don't know what he says, maybe it says thinking, but I don't know what he means, uh, by paper clips from exposed ceiling joints. But heck, the word basement is also a bit of a misnomer. It was a dirt-floored cellar with cut stone walls, but it had heat. However, despite the comfortable temperature, it did not prove to be a desirable location for Vapid, at least initially. He was a bit creeped out by the dungeon-like surroundings and the fact that he was truly quite far away from the rest of us in the control room and Ben in the main performance room. As soon as I turned on his mic to get levels, he began singing alternate lyrics to I Don't Want to Go Down to the Basement by the Ramones. Hey, weasel -o, you sent Vapido down to the base. There's something down here. I don't want to go. Weasel O, down to the base. I'm not as good at singing it as Vapid. Vapid probably did exactly uh, like the Ramones would have done it. Um, but that's, I remember that too, Mass, what Mass writes here. Uh, I remember when Vapid got into there and just started singing spontaneously. Uh, and then uh, Mass goes on. Then little by little, by goofing around, Vapid began to feel more and more comfortable and giggle and sing silly things almost constantly. All of this drove Ben, who tended to be quite serious when it came to studio recording, more than just half nuts. At the end of the first vocal take, when Ben was talking to me about what he wanted to hear in his headphones, uh, says Mass, as Vapid kept singing random pop songs and making goofy voices, Ben got upset and kept telling Vapid to shut up. Vapid didn't, however, and it was hilarious. By the end of the vocals, Vapid felt quite safe in his little vocal dungeon castle. Um, yeah, Vapid is always really fun in those sort of situations. Um, and it was really nice to see those two work together. And Ben was constantly running out of his booth into Vapid's booth to share some ideas with him and then running back again. Um, and I was sitting at the, uh, council with Mass all of that time. Um, 
I really like to watch those two work. Uh, so let's get into the record. Um, the first track, I'm Gonna Strangle You. Uh, ben says in this in a video that uh, was, which was, um, where was it done? It was done in Detroit, because that's where we have Ben Hamper. Uh, there's a video of us uh, playing a whole concert, and he says that this song is from a woman's point of view. Um, I don't know, so that's all I wanted to say about that. Um, but what I will say is, at, at the start of uh, the record, um, that um, Ben and I, uh, Ben went back to guitar, and um, in this recording, uh, we're always, one of us is in the left and the right uh, speakers, uh, both rhythm tracks. Uh, so I'm always in the left side, and Ben is always in the right side. Um, except, it's interestingly, except for the Totally and Every Night uh, recordings, uh, were reversed, so we're reverse side. So if that stuff is sort of interesting to you and you want to go back and listen to it on headphones, um, you can distinguish whose guitar is whose. Um, and then I'm going to read what I wrote here, uh, Ben. Oh, and this is what Ben had said about returning back to guitar, because this was his return back to guitar, because he wasn't playing guitar much on Bogota, or actually he hadn't been playing much on any of the records, um, but he had always sort of uh, learned the songs, and he played a couple songs, like on Bogota he played a couple songs uh, on guitar. Um, so Ben says, Vapin moved back to bass, and I picked up the guitar again, only this time. I wasn't going to play guitar only half the songs. I'd be a full-time second guitarist. This meant that for three months, I spent three hours every day playing our songs on guitar without looking at the guitar neck. I sort of mastered the whole thing. Um, so I think the idea that this was four members in a band that were all playing an instrument probably has a lot to do with uh, people considering it their favorite record. It's a very solid uh, ensemble working on songs that were pretty much created as a concept by one guy, Ben. Um, so I think there's a lot of a magical, uh, uh, sort of magical cooperation going on there to support this project that we all believed in. Um, so number two, falling apart. Um, the, along with Ben playing guitar now, he he started playing a little bit more subtle guitar parts. Like, uh, for instance, um, oh, let me get my guitar, hold on. Um, this is a really simple thing, but he uh, enjoyed, and this is gonna be hard now on my acoustic, but he discovered this sort of, when you can do the bar chord, you can also, you can put your finger down here, or the pinky down, to create that sort of, uh, that sort of added sound. I don't know what it is. Maybe, uh, you know, if you're a guitarist, you might know uh, or know music theory, you know what that is, but it's sort of a rock and roll sort of thing to do. I actually know it from Michael Shanker, who uses that a lot. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's what I'm talking about. So he discovered that sort of stuff and he uses that on uh, Falling Apart. Um, so these little subtleties became a little bit more accepted in the band, which is the stuff I re always really liked too. I thought, uh, especially on my brain hurts, uh, most of my stuff that was, uh, I think, important to me was very subtle sort of uh, little strumming sounds or how I played. Uh, and sort of Ben uh, came on board in this sort of idea too. Now that he was actually a musician in the band, he started to concentrate more on that. And I, that is the beginning of this song. Um, it's his really strong sort of acceptance of that and the little intricacies you could do to make a, a, a rhythm part sound a little bit more uh, interesting. Um, and I also put on this, it, uh, he was always a better at downstroking, Ben, and I was better at strumming. Um, so I thought that really worked together on this record. Um, also, I think falling apart... Uh, when I first heard this song, I thought this was great. I thought it was really moving forwards and Ben sort of uh, allowing his own personal life to 
uh, guide his uh, creation, his you know his lyrics. Um, and I wrote here, uh, it's about you know it's about alienation, it's about being an outcast, which are great topics for uh, punk rock. Uh, and I think this sort of, him capturing this and why this might be one of his favorite records, and I think this song is a good uh, expression of that, is that uh, this sort of uh, look inside oneself sort of really skyrocketed the band to hit punks more emotionally, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later, this idea of uh, emotion and how it became a movement called emo. Um, so I think th that song is one of my favorites on the record. Uh, super strong song, great beginning, uh, very good content. Um, this and this third song, Leather Jacket, I don't I don't have anything. Um, I was trying to discover or remember what was going on with Ben and Portia then, because there's a lot of these songs that have sort of a a punk rock take on like what the Beatles do with love songs. But uh, what I think is really cool is it really brought it home to Chicago and it really brought it down to being a punk in love. Uh, and this is just sort of one of those little good examples of that. I don't know if it was specifically about Portia and him because they went through a lot of hard times. Um, but uh, man, that's all I have to say about it. Also, you know, leather jackets were always a big deal to Ben because of the Ramones. And, and more and more it became more important to him uh, through the Riverdales, and he tried to bring that back into Weasel, which I will talk about on Bark Like a Dog, which is one of the big arguments that him and I had uh, as this sort of obsession with leather jackets, uh, which I thought was a little bit too cliche for for Screeching Weasel. Um, and so now I will go on to number four, which is Rubber Room. Um, let's see what I wrote here. I wrote this a while ago, so uh, I will start from whatever I wrote here. We didn't tour hardly any of these songs. No memories are cemented. All the following records would be created each in their own vacuum, removed from audience reaction and growing the songs as a guitarist. Um, so we, uh, that was my thing, is I didn't really remember anything about uh, why we did this song. Until I, I listened to it today, and, and I know that specifically Ben was referencing the uh, Anger Samoans, uh, so we sort of still sort of had that f uh, flavor of being inspired by the Anger Samoans, which had hit us right out of the gate from uh, our first record in Abugada with AOD and Angry Samoans. And then we it slowly started moving towards uh, Ramones. Um, but this is a little trace of uh, the Angry Samoans feeling and how he ends the song with, Wow! That's very much a metal mic from the Angry Samoans sort of uh, sound. Um... And then we come to five, which is one of my favorite songs and uh, definitely became sort of a, a, a string of ideas for Ben throughout, throughout all the records. And it's called Talk To Me Summer, which is uh, our first instrumental song that we did as a band. Um, I think, and like I said, now that Ben was playing guitar, uh, he enjoyed rehearsals a little bit more. Through Wiggle, he just hated rehearsals. He would bring in song, uh, his songs and then kind of want to leave right away. Um, but I think now that he had this new sort of uh, goal to be a better guitar player, I think it allowed him to... Uh, I don't think he loved it, but I think it allowed him to understand the uh, the great things and the intricacies of of rehearsal and um so he just stuck around a lot more in rehearsals and was having a lot more fun so this led to the idea of you know doing an instrumental because now he could tour and not have to sit out while we were doing you know m musical uh instrumental stuff um so that was obviously one of the reasons this became one of the, the first instrumental on a record where he we were all playing instruments uh is that all I want to say? Oh, no, no, we, we both had solos in this, too. I, I'm pretty sure Ben had come in with the rhythm of it and the idea of the song, and I came up with this very repetitive uh, beginning. So I am playing uh, that beginning part, if you know the song very well. It's just the same thing over and over again over the changing of the chords. Um, and then Ben's guitar sound comes in for the middle section, um, 
which that's another reason I really love this because it sort of shows the difference in sound that him and I both had. Um, his had more of a deeper sound, my had more of a piercing, um, a repetitive sort of uh, feel to it more. Um, I, and I always loved his parts even more than what I was doing. I was always, not jealous, but I really liked the way he played. Um, but I think they worked really together really well, and I've I've gotten a little bit more uh, support in my over the years, especially doing these of people pointing out songs that they really like and why, and uh, a lot of them tend to be these little uh, parts that I had come up with too out of the songs that Ben had written. Um, so this was uh, one of them. Um, like I said, uh, it, it was just a, a great song and sort of a, a contribution of everyone working together and. And Vapid, going back to bass after having guitar and being sort of a lead guitarist, that man, you know, could play any instrument, um, would do anything for Screeching Weasel at that time, um, just to be in the band. I remember when we approached uh, Vapid about him going back to bass, um, I think he was a little disappointed at first, but then he really, really just... just uh, held on to and created some great, very subtle, uh, melodic bass parts that go throughout this whole record. Um, also, Talk To Me Summer, as I see on my note here, is the only one where I play a solo at all. I have a little teeny part later that I'll talk about, but um, it's a really stripped-down record in many ways. Uh, there's not too many solos, and uh, that is my only melodic solo on the whole record. Uh, number six, Inside Out. Um, all I have here is uh, emo record in response to the fact that Ben had been writing very emotional music for years. Uh, so, Inside Out, it, once again, it's just about him exploring uh, his more his 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 own emotions and his own relationship and. Um, I think I I don't want to get too much into this because uh, there's more notes that I will reference later, so I'm going to leave this one kind of short because all of this stuff uh, comes up a little bit later in in later songs. Um, but the idea was that um, Ben had a sort of a harsh reaction to the emo movement later on because I think he felt that what he was doing and what people like uh, Jawbreaker were doing and Fugazi, they were already doing very emotional music. And pop punk wasn't considered an emotional uh, music sort of band. It was con uh, a movement. It was considered more of a, you know, poppy um, love songs. Um, and I think that is sort of a... A, a sore point with me, too, that uh, a lot of the things that are remembered of Weasel are the, us being a pop-punk band. But to me, what it really was is taking the Ramon sound, the angry Samoan sound, the AOD sound, starting out from the suburbs, but then also moving into more social, political uh, ideas and about uh, sculpting yourself as an individual. And uh, I think a lot of that stuff was... was I don't know, wasn't as... Uh, I think the hardcore fans really understand that about us, but in general what we're known for is, is sparking the pop-punk generation, which is a little bit more candy and, a little bit more candy and sugary than um, what I think at the heart of what we were doing. And I think that's why the emo movement sort of rubbed him a little wrong and why we would create an album called Emo later. Um, number seven, Peter Brady. Uh, this is probably my favorite uh, musical song on the record. I just love the way it's constructed, and it has a little part by Fat Mike and a part by Vapid, and then um, it has this great reference to uh, the Brady Bunch, of course, which um, was, you know, we had done uh, Murder at the Brady House, um, this TV sort of influence that we had from AOD and a lot of our suburban growing up and watching a lot of TV. And Ben and I used to watch a lot of TV at his house. Um, I think Pee Wee Herman was the big one that threw, a, threw much of the band. We would go home and watch Pee Wee Herman and then uh, MTV. Um, so this song is based on an episode 
uh, called The Double Date by uh, uh, of the Brady Bunch. And uh, Peter Brady is pretending to be this guy, Phil Packer, um, because his brother Greg wants to go on a date with a woman and, and she has a friend and so they set, set it up at, at, that Peter would wear a mustache and, um, and pretend to be this guy, Phil Packer. I, I'm going to play a little uh, clip from that because then you'll, if you know the record, you know the song, you know exactly where these parts are from. So uh, here it is. I had to go with Mr. Calderon. Luckily, we're still in business. Oh, that's a relief. Good. They didn't exactly approve of your X-rated behavior, but they did admire the way you and the girls told the truth. Really sorry about the whole thing. Well, yeah, I really learned something. Uh -huh. One, you act your age. And two, you don't try to be something you're not. And three... Yes? You find out in advance what restaurant your mom and dad are going to and go someplace else. <laughs> So, so that's actually taken word for word uh, for this song. And it, it was just great how he can turn it into his, his, a meaning for himself about the idea of pretending you're something you're not. Um, I think there's also a double meaning with for Ben. I don't want to talk about the lyrics, but it seems like he's implying something else, like there's somebody using that as an excuse of being who you're not. Um, he's, he's a very complex man, uh, Ben, and I don't always... Uh, pretend to understand uh, what I think is his opinion is actually what he is uh, against um, so I'm not going to say exactly what his opinion on that is um, but uh, but so Vapid does the part boy I really learned a lot today and then uh, when when Ben I, mean, I think I might talk about this later but when Ben um, decided to re-record all his vocals and do a couple other things he was very disappointed in how it sounded out of the Sonic Iguana, how his vocals sounded. Um, he went, he flew out to California and worked um, with uh, Lawrence Livermore from Lookout and for Andy in that recording studio and redid all his vocals and then had Fat Mike come in and sing uh, that whole part about the, the lessons. Um, I was really. I thought that was pretty great. We had always just missed. I think on a lot of our tours, we would be touring at the same time as uh, No Effects, but we never played with No Effects. They were always right behind us or right uh, in front of us somewhere. That also happened with um, uh, what's his name from uh, the Misfits. Why can't I remember his name right now? See this. That's why sometimes. I, when I go off my own notes, I can't remember. And I can't remember his name. My God. Anyway, maybe it'll come to me later. Uh, but basically, we were always sort of playing around uh, these other bands. Um, uh, so I think it was a really great idea to get Fat Mike into the studio. And their, their voices are a little bit similar. Um, and that's just, it's just a really powerful song. Um, it's funny. And it has sort of levels of... Uh, of philosophy in it. So I think it has uh, all of the best worlds in that song. Uh, number eight, uh, you know what? I, I'm going to have to look up his name right now because I it's, it's bothering me that I can't even, as soon as I see it, I'm going to be really floored that I can't even remember his name right now from The Misfits. I know you're all going, John, you can't remember the guy from The Misfits' name? Um, where is it? Danzig! <laughs> so we were always playing. Uh, we would go into all these venues, and Danzig will have just played there. Uh, that was, uh, I don't know, it plagued us. It, it seemed like every time I was booking a tour, it seemed to be booking it around the same time that Danzig was playing. So anyway, uh, number eight is I, Robot. This is one of those where I don't really have much to say about it. I'm just going to read uh, ben, Ben's notes about it. Uh, he says, as a side note, I wrote a few tunes for the Gorgo Girls that ended up being re-recorded -re with Screeching Weasel. Uh, the Gorgo Girls, as I've said on, a, on an, a, another YouTube, was a band that me and Ben formed after the first breakup of Screeching Weasel, before we were on Lookout Records. And that's how we got to meet uh, many people, uh, Johnny Personality and David Lally. Uh, who would be David Naked? Dave Naked. 
Um, so the songs he says uh, were Don't Turn Out the Lights, which was on My Brain Hurts, uh, One Step Beyond, which was on Wiggle, Kathy's on the Roof, um, which I think is on an EP, can't remember which one, and I, Robot, uh, which was originally titled Lost in Space, uh, which is another reference to another TV show of an older generation. Um, so that's all I have to say about that one. Uh, number nine is Every Night. Um, I wrote here, once again, Ben seeing himself as, as a guitarist and more essential to rehearsals uh, led to songs like this that have a long, driving-like outro that to me makes the song more powerful. In some ways, lets the music speak for the mood. Uh, once again, this... This may be one of the best songs uh, Ben has ever written. Um, I'm not even going to talk about lyrics. I'm talking about how I relate to song as an emotion and how he sounds and how people react to the song and how people sing along. Um, and this sort of, uh, you know, I'll talk a little bit about self-deprecating, which I think many bands can get too much into the idea of uh, lambasting oneself, criticizing oneself. But this song does that. But what I, what I think a lot of self-deprecating hides is this is sort of an ego problem. Uh, I'm not specifically saying about that about Ben because I think at this time he had a little bit more pure of heart when it came to this stuff. But um, I think self-deprecating always has a little uh, too much selfishness involved, and where I mean, if you allow yourself to get that so involved in and hating yourself. Uh, to me, it's that you're not paying enough attention to the other people around you or the world outside of you. Um, but this song it just has enough flavoring of self-deprecation that, uh, that paints just a, a great picture. And the music really feeds into the, the lyrics very well. I think it's a very strong, strong song. And I think we captured it on that first time we, re we recorded it. And I would even agree that our second take of it, I don't even know if it's out there anywhere in the world, Mass probably has it. I don't think we re-released it um, because it just isn't very good. Somehow we captured exactly what he wanted to say and how we wanted to play it on that first uh, recording. And I think that, even more than totally, was probably one of the reasons he decided to use songs from uh, our demo. Um, so I'll go on. Number 10, and here's the other one. So th I think this was, if you're talking LP, this would, that would have been uh, the ending of side one, uh, which is great, because we didn't really do a lot of fade-out songs, and this was one of the only ones, because uh, I know Ben and I talked about the idea that fade-out songs gives you the impression that the song never ends, that it keeps on going on and on and on and on, and we sort of wanted that feel for the song, and those are easier to get away with uh, at the end of sides of records. On a CD, it doesn't make as much sense in the middle, but that's what we were playing with that song. Uh, so the first song on the second side was totally... Uh, what I'll say about this one is uh, he talks about Belmont and Damon and the Damon bus. And that's where uh, him and Vapid and Portia had lived prior to this, uh, to this record. By this time, he was living... Yeah, with Joe Vindictive, uh, Ben and Portia. I'm not sure where Vapid was. Uh, one thing, uh, I'll just paint the picture of that area. Right down the street, a friend of mine worked at uh, basically a check-in patients at a mental health clinic. Um, so there was a lot of weird, bizarre stuff always going on on that, uh, the, the Belmont bus. It was known for that. Um, also, there were a lot of 24-hour diners. And there's one right on the corner where uh, Vapid and Ben used to go, and then I would occasionally join them. Uh, they always would talk about the uh, chef. Uh, everyone had their, their special 24-hour diner in Chicago, and that was theirs. Uh, it was in Roscoe Village was the name of the area. Um, and I have a lot of good memories of, of, of that period of them living together. But that was prior to this. I'm just lead, leading up to... Um, I think that song sort of had the flavor of the of when they were living together back then. Um, and now here's what I'll write, because uh, that leads into 
talking about uh, Ben and Portia moving into Joe Vindictive's house. Um, and then I contacted Joe about, uh, about Anthem for New Tomorrow. Uh, actually, he responded to something that I had wrote online, and he wrote back to me. I'll do this try to word for word. Uh, Joe, Vindictive, Joe Vindictive says, I sang backing vocals, vocals on one of the songs, uh, which is A New Tomorrow. Uh, back then, Ben would write a lot of the foundations of the songs using my piano. Actually, I recently found the original photo used on the cover of My Brain Hurts. I collected stills and promo photos for old movies and would pick up odd and surreal ones. One day, Ben was looking through them and asked to borrow it for the cover. We used to sit around and write little pieces and bring them to our respective bands from Bukata, Bukata, Bukata onward. Um, I wanted that there because it's really important, uh, the relationship that the bond that slowly moved from like vapid and Ben to Ben and Joe Vindictive. Um, and it's kind of interesting that uh, Ben moved more gu to guitar, but he would end up writing more, I think, originally, his original ideas on piano. Um, and that would start showing up. Uh, it showed up a little bit on I, My Brain Hurts, I think. I think there might be some piano. But it, uh, it, he really sort of brought in the, that organ sounding stuff on, on uh, Anthem for New Tomorrow, which he recorded all of that stuff while he was with uh, Larry Livermore in California. Um, but more and more, he just started working on the piano instead of the bass. I think he started out using the bass a lot, Ben, and then uh, a little bit on guitar because he learned the, you know, the two chord, the two, two finger. Uh, power chord, and then he moved to uh, piano. He always had a piano at his house, but I think uh, when he moved to Joe's, it became more of a, a prevalent aspect of uh, writing songs. Uh, number 11 is Three Sides. Uh, what I'll say about this is that there's this radio static at the beginning of it. Um, and radio, I think, sort of harkens back to these uh, ideas that Ben plays with of of the stagnation and the decaying underneath of like the 50s and the, the 80s with Reagan and that sort of uh, trying to break out of the mold, you know, how an outcast is always trying to break out of the mold of, con of conforming. Um, so the radio, I think, has a sort of a feel for that for Ben. Um, and he did all that stuff once again while he was in California. He came up with all of the, the radio stuff that goes throughout the whole record. Um, but radio was still a part of uh, our relationship a lot. You know, Ben and I used to listen to the radio a lot in his uh, Chevy Malibu. Uh, so I, he recorded a bunch of stuff. I don't think he knew what he was going to do with it. He recorded a bunch of radio stuff that sort of appealed to him. And he used it uh, when he mixed the album in California with Larry and Andy. Um, so three sides, I don't want to get into the lyrics again, it's really short lyric, my lyrics, but um, it's three sides to every story. Basically, I think, uh, I don't know whether he's saying that there are different opinions and different realities. I think he's more saying that he's just sick and tired of people talking about they're all different sides and why don't they just commit to some, you know, some choice. Um, but this made me think about uh, the idea of believing you're right and the gray areas and the difference. I talk about this in my book, but the difference between strong differences between me and Ben, I think, is that um, he commits to the idea of being right. He's a very smart man, um, but there is something to do with, to me, I wish I could do a study about it because I don't know enough about, enough about science and I don't have the time to do it, but there is something about believing you are right and how strong your memory is over years. Uh, for me, I was always sort of a, an emotional man and, and got very confused when uh, people were very strongly opinionated. I tend to make really good friends that are very strongly opinionated, and uh, I tend to be used, I don't know if I used by those like against my will, but it seems like a thing that they like about me too. Um, but what I think is interesting is that this more emotional side for me 
led to me being a little bit less concentrated on memory. And I just think that's an interesting dynamic between him and I, or, or just those ideas that someone who thinks they're right are going to have more a solid memory of the past. Uh, it may get farther and farther away from um, a more shared reality, but it definitely has stronger ties uh, than someone like me, who uh, well, I don't know, you know, there's some things that uh, are so nonlinear in my life that I don't know what happened first or second, and I always have to go back to first and secondary sources to try to figure that shit out. Um, I'll also talk about here, um, that leads me into talking about conformity and individualism. I think another cool thing that Ben and I always had in common, uh, which was odd, was that we were both big fans of Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson, who were the leaders of the transcendentalist uh, movements back in the 1800s. Um, they were writers about the sort of the movement of and transcendentalism was also about individuality and uh, the different realities we create around us and perceptions uh, and the idea of conformity and uh, the idea of trying to break out of that. Um, mine uh, growing up was interesting. I had uh, my mom gave me a plaque, or my brother actually did, but it was a a thing that meant a lot to me it was Henry David Thoreau's quote that says, "If a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music which he hears, however measured or or far away." Uh, so I always loved that quote, um, and and Ben and I sort of bonded over. Uh, the book Walden by Henry David Thoreau and these sort of uh, also statements by his uh, mentor, which was Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, who, who said, to be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. Um, also, I was trying to find what Ben and I used to talk about. I couldn't find it here, but we used to talk about how the uh, the identity is sort of fluid and that uh, you know your opinions change over time. Um, I feel that had a lot to do with uh, understanding Ben over the many years. Um, but I couldn't find that, that quote. But it went back to these ideas of individualism and nonconformity in uh, the writings of the early Americans during the Civil War of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. And that sort of all came out while I was listening to that very short song, Three Sides. <laughs> Uh, now number 12 I don't want to be friends I don't have anything I thought it was just a song about someone he didn't want to be friends with and then um, I thought maybe it was about Portia and Ben's relationship ultimately I don't know what it is um, there's a lot of these songs a few songs right in a row here that are the songs that sort of prevent this from being my favorite record um, they're strong they're still really strong songs but they just don't do anything for me maybe as a member I just don't remember much about them so they sit less important in my brain um, so I'm gonna pass that one and go on to uh, number 13 which is a cancer in my body I can only think this is um, a song Ben dealing with anxiety um, anxiety was sort of creeping in to uh, Ben's reality a little bit more I think in the early days of touring he was experiencing this uncomfortable, this uncomfortableness of being on the road. Um, he was sort of agoraphobic and didn't like the way being away from home. Um, but in the early days, it really sort of worked for us, where we would have these shows that would just go off the rail. Because I think the way he would feel more comfortable on stage um, is to uh, attack. So he was either attacking songs or he would attack something that happened in the audience. He was always very aware of what was going on in the audience. Um, so he would look for things that sort of would maybe release that tension he was feeling. Um, and then the, the irony is that it would create tension in us, but I think it really started uh, selling the band. And then, of course, then the band, then all the audiences expected him. They wanted you know, him to be the Don Rickles of punk rock. And I think that eventually got him to him too, uh, to the point where we were on Anthem for True Tomorrow and when we toured this record, 
we pretty much stayed straight to our set and went from beginning to end of the of the set and he didn't do as much um sort of lambasting of the audience on this tour with the queers uh, leading up to the recording of anthem uh so i think that's really interesting um then number 14 of th is thrift store girl um I, once again, I don't know if this is about Portia or about just some incident he had, or is it just him um, sort of uh, exploring what Chicago was at that point. In the early 90s, uh, Wicker Park was starting to become a, a big deal around there. He had lived there for a while with uh, Doug Ward from ID Under and uh, Underdog Records. And uh, there was a lot of thrift stores uh, back then in Wicker Park, and there's the, our grunge waves, we would call them, the girls and the guys were all, you know, there's a lot of artists moving in and a lot of gentrification going on. Um, and I think Chicago, as I've learned, being all over most of the world and definitely all over the States and Europe, Chicago has sort of a, a better hold on the idea of thrift store than the rest of the country. Uh, the U.S. Um, it thrift store still means in Chicago a place to go to get clothes that are really cheap because someone didn't want them anymore, because some or because someone died. You know, I still get my shoes for a dollar, probably wearing some dead man's shoes. Um, so I think it, it isn't just a throwaway title. I think it really sort of epitomized Chicago in that time period about how. Um, most of the artists then and the musicians were all living dirt, 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 dirt cheap and uh, going to thrift stores uh, like the village discounts to buy all their clothes. Like I would, I, you know, I would buy a whole outfit, you know, a shirt and pants and shoes for like uh, three bucks. Um, so I think that's interesting and I, uh, I think that's very particular to Chicago uh, from my experience. Uh, number 15 is a song called Panic. And I'm just going to read this because I don't remember what I wrote. Uh, the worry about going crazy. Anxiety makes you feel like you have lost your mind and makes you question what is real and what isn't. May force you to be more concrete in your beliefs. The big problems are easy. They don't cause the anxiety. It is the little things that build up. The resistance to thinking and change and the small errors people make that they think will be nothing. Um, what this song is going to lead me to is, uh, you know, the song is a little bit about dealing with anxiety and thinking you're crazy. And if you're smiling, you know, it's a sort of self-awareness and self-deprecating of, do I look crazy? Am I not crazy? Um, but this reminded me of the things on the road that uh, Ben and I would talk about that would create the most anxiety or the most tension, uh, weren't the big problems, you know, the big problems seemed to be more easy to solve you know they were big problems so you had to do it like if we have a cracked axle and we're about to go off the road in the mountains like what happened to us on the tour prior we know we had to cancel gigs go to an auto shop and get it fixed there was no like you know there's no tension or anxiety over it. it's just you have to do it you know or you're you have to get through the desert to your next show, but you're, there's no air conditioning in your car and your Chevy Malibu is overheating. We had no choice. We had to do it. And we learned that you can turn the heating on to pull the uh, heat away from the engine so it wouldn't overheat the engine. So we drove through the desert in 120-degree weather uh, with the heaters on. And uh, we almost died. You know, I mean, from heat exhaustion, but that was kind of an obvious, you know, there was no tension or anxiety. It was a situation that we knew what we had to do and we did it. Uh, the things that would get to Ben more are the little things that people would do over and over again and never learn a lesson. And this sort of uh, bothered him a lot on tours and about this sort of punk aesthetic that if you're a punk, you should not have to do, you, you should get away from these other more professional things. Um, and he started, what I'm getting at is he would, he would start losing, he'd start losing his voice. We'd get to these venues uh, that were done by kids and renting moose lodge halls. And 
Um, there was no monitors. Um, you know, the, the show would go on forever. Uh, people would be sneaking in alcohol and, and punks and alcohol sometimes, you know, would end up meaning things get destroyed and blamed on the band. So he created this contract that uh, was done by us ourselves, not lawyers. It was just us creating rules of what we would like to happen at a show. And it was my responsibility as the booking agent to make sure that each venue uh, paid attention to each one of these rules in the contract. And one of Ben's stipulations was is that stip stipulations stipulations is that if these weren't all followed, he would have the the uh, the legal ability to walk away. Um, and he pulled out this he pulled this out quite a lot on the road, which created tension in me. Um, because I had to deal with the fallout of it. But in most cases, um, like one time in Boston, uh, with the queers and us, the, the guy had no monitors and he goes, well, you know, not having monitors is okay. And I was like, and Ben started walking away back to the van. And I was like, no, it's not okay. You are the promoter. You need to get us monitors. This man is going to lose his voice and we have a whole eight week tour to go. You need to do this. Um, and this guy took it very seriously. He was well, he was one of the good ones. Um, he was trying to pull something over us on us, but then he really it was a Sunday, so it was hard to get a you know find a place that was open. But uh, we worked together on trying to find a place to get monitors, and the show happened. It was a great show in Boston with the queers, and uh, that's where the contract worked. Um, I'll talk about one later where I think it it failed. But um, this was, like that. what I'm saying, is the small things that people think are nothing are the ones that over time build up and build up and build up and, and create this sort of anxiety and tension. Um, so number 16 is trance. Uh, and really quickly, I'm going to see if Vapid got back to me because it's the only song on the record that he has partial credit for. Um, I was hoping he might get back to me by today because I didn't know. He hasn't. That's all right. He usually gets back to me pretty quick, but uh, I decided to do this one on the whim tonight, so I didn't get anything from him. Um, if I do, maybe I'll post it on the comments, what he has to say. Um, but, yeah, had nothing to add to the songs. Well, you know, B Vapid had said in uh, an interview that uh, the reason he isn't co-creating any of these songs, besides Trance, is that he didn't feel there was anything he could add to the songs, that they felt complete to him. I think this is mostly true. I also think it was sort of a, a decaying of their their relationship had already started. You know, I think uh, Vapid was starting to move over in other directions, and Ben was moving in other directions, and they weren't living together anymore. Uh, so that might have something to do with it. But, but he's kind of right, too. Ben really came in with this very solid record, very stripped-down, simplified record with strong lyrics. And there really wasn't much that any of us could add to it. Um, so that's what I'll say about that. Also, there's some... Uh, ben was sort of, like I said, learning guitar. Um, so there's a lot of accidental string sounds that really add to this sort of metallic weird robotic uh, sound to it so you can listen for that uh, but those were accidental um, there's like weird you know little side effect sounds of of strings that aren't supposed to be hit and chimings going on that were uh, sort of add to the song but weren't intentional um, number 17 Claire Monet uh, once again I, I'm not going to talk about the lyrics this is a very sort of Ramonesy feel uh, song. Um, I didn't like it that much. I didn't like playing it, um, but listening back to it, I, I, uh, I liked it a little bit more. What I did like is that I came up with this little, uh, that wah-wah guitar part that's in the song is me. And um, I used, one of the few other times I used my second guitar, which was a, a Telecaster, a Gibson Telecaster guitar I had. Um, I preferred my Westone, um, it was a piece of junk, but it, you know, it, you know, it meant a lot to me. Um, so I had this as a backup guitar, the Telecaster. Um, but the Telecaster came with a, a wah-wah, um, you know, a 
what they call a whammy bar. That's what they call it. it. Had a whammy bar on it, so I could sort of bend uh, notes. So that sort of became a a big part of this uh, this song. This good uh, the guitar part in this song. Um, also, what I'll lead to about that is that this Telecaster also has a story of its own. Um, even though it wasn't my favorite guitar, it sort of went off and had its own life. <laughs> um, every gig that we had in Chicago, Joe, who would later go on to form uh, 88 Fingers Louie and then Rise Against, was always trying to bu buy that guitar from me. And I just wasn't into sell. I didn't, you know, have, I wasn't attached to it, but I just wasn't into selling things. And he asked, you know, a lot of money for for this cheap guitar I had, this cheap uh, Telecaster. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And it sort of really uh, uh, solidified my friendship over the years with Joe Principe. Um, I wouldn't say we're great friends, but I always have a soft spot in my heart for, for him and his, uh, his dedication to trying to buy my Telecaster. Uh, eventually, years and years and years and years later, uh, I would take the Mangies... Uh, from Italy on tour, and on the way here to the States, uh, Andrea's guitar um, broke because you know you're not supposed to have the strings uh, on your guitar when you when you fly because of the uh, temperature drop and the atmospheric uh, effects on a guitar and the pressure. Um, so his neck snapped of the guitar so um we did the whole, whole tour um i think it was okay on the tour and then it slowly started breaking and then when he went to go move went to go back to italy i gave him this uh telecaster guitar i had um and i think it blew his mind um, um so we threw away his other guitar and he took the telecaster back with him uh, it turned out the telecaster was worthless too it didn't it didn't work really because i hadn't used it in years um, but I think it meant a lot to him, and he hung it on his wall. He fixed it up, and it didn't it didn't work. So I don't think he ever really used it. But it's it's I think it's uh, it was a really cool. I don't know. It was a good gesture on my part, and it was really important to me to give it to someone who uh, really wanted it. And the other cool thing too is that on the what we did on this tour is that we actually uh, taped our set lists onto our guitar because we were going to do the same set list every night. And then we had a few different encore songs that were, would change out. But we, it was sort of showing uh, ourselves and the audience that this was we, what we were going to do. These are the songs we're going to do. These are the ones we committed to. We're going to make them as good as possible. We're going to have a great time. Um, and we weren't really a spontaneous band then. The spontaneous stuff came in the sort of, you know, Ben sort of jabs at the audience. But... Uh, we were more into, at this point, the precision of us as a four-piece. And we were going to commit to the order of these songs. No matter what the feel was in the room, we were in charge, and this is what we were going to do. Um, so that was pasted on this side of the guitar. And so uh, Andrea from the Mangies has that somewhere in his place. I think maybe on his wall or something. I don't know. Maybe in a closet. But I know it, it's, it's, it means a lot to him. And it means a lot to me that he has it. Um, wow, we've gotten to the end here. 18, A New Tomorrow. Um, this is an intense song. It sort of really encapsulates the whole record and Ben's sort of idea of uh, these songs being an anthem for a new tomorrow, for a new belief for him. Maybe this sort of uh, the idea of recognizing himself, himself as someone who has anxiety and psychological uh problems to deal with and overcome that uh, this song sort of represents that as an album and that as a concept and the idea of moving on to a new world of dealing with this shit um, and on the song has uh, great uh, guests Blake uh, Schwarzenbach from um, Jawbreaker and uh, who is on a Cassandra Millspow I think is her name uh, she was in a band called Queen Mob, Mab. I don't really remember much about her. I know that she was really cool, and she was a cool punk, and she came in with, uh, with Blake from Jawbreaker, and, um, and also Joe Vindictive, and this is what I'm going to, am I going to read this now, what he says? 
Yes. So uh, I asked Joe where this was recorded because Mass couldn't remember uh, either. Uh, so Joe wrote back to me, uh, the other vocalists on A New Tomorrow were recorded with Mark Schwartz at the original Flat Iron Recording Studio in Chicago, later Uber Studio. It was with Blake, Cassandra, and myself. The Vindictives had just finished recording there, or were in the middle. Um, so Joe had the idea of, of bringing us to that studio. And we had also recorded uh, songs there, too. Um, so the song was already all recorded. Ben's part was recorded. No, no, it wasn't. No, Ben actually sang with them, too. Uh, so all four of those vocalists uh, sang on that song. Um, what else did I want to say? Oh, you know, I did write something interesting here. Uh, Jawbreaker later that year would tour with Nirvana, and Ben would write about it in his then zine Panic Button. It's a really cool article. You can find it online. Um, but uh, Jawbreaker was opening up for Nirvana, and this was after he had uh, recorded with us for these vocals. And Ben went and was going to write about uh, meeting Nirvana and ended up writing about their uh, nanny for the... for for Kurt Cobain's uh, baby. Uh, so it's an interesting story, but um, that is that last song without me actually talking about the lyrics. Um, oh, you know, another thing I was going to say that uh, the second Uber studio from Mark Schwartz is where we recorded Bark Like a Dog. Uh, now I'm going to end this with... Um, We'll see. Maybe this is going to be the end, and I have one other statement I want to say. But I'm going to end this with Mass's uh, second paragraph that he wrote to me uh, when I asked him about this record. So Mass Giorgini said, Anthem for a New Tomorrow was the third Screeching Weasel album recorded at Sonic Iguana, but it was the first one done at the second studio location. Wiggle and the Ramones cover album were both done in the hodgepodge of back rooms of the door company I managed. Second Sonic Iguana location was right near the corner of 5th and Main Street in downtown Lafayette and was a much more interesting environment than the industrial park of the first location. At that time, trains still ran through the streets of Lafayette, and one of those was 5th Street. In fact, the official Lafayette, the official Lafayette Amtrak stop was right in front of the studio. Funny enough, Paul Mayhern took advantage of that when we worked on the original mix of Anthem for a New Tomorrow. He hopped off the train to Lafayette from Indianapolis and walked off the train and into the front door of the studio. It was great to have Paul included in the mix, as he was one of my heroes and mentors in the world of audio production. He had been the lead singer of the legendary Zero Boys, but had also produced classic recordings by bands such as Articles of Faith, Toxic Reasons, Sloppy Seconds, and many other independent label seminal punk bands before going on to produce artists such as Iggy Pop, Willie Nelson, and John Mellencamp. Paul and I worked on a mix together, and I am still confident that it was far superior to the one which eventually was released. But, as I recall, Ben was neither satisfied with his own vocal performance or with the mix itself, which he believed was too heavy and not nearly poppy enough. That was also a big thing we were dealing with on Wiggle. So, you know, Ben was always sort of dealing with the limitations of his voice and what he heard in his head. So, um, and then Mass says, in the end, the mix was shelved, and then Ben, convinced that he could not sing vocals properly in Indiana, flew out to the West Coast to do his vocals over again. Fortunately, nothing affected Vapid's vocals, and his original takes were used for the final mix. I think that's really interesting that... Uh, I mean, Ben was definitely more comf comfortable with Larry in California, I think, away from us. Yeah, maybe it, sort of, it was sort of like bookends for him, where the songs were started by him, by himself, brought him to the band, we created the music, and then maybe in some ways he just wanted to go off away from us and finish it up. Um, and that's why I think this record has good and bad memories for me, and and implications of the same because I think oh well someone oh look at Dan just wrote, back, wrote me back so I'll probably say that but first I want to finish this thought um, it's a solid record but it's sort of uh, is the beginning of us moving away from being a band 
Uh, and maybe it's, once again, might be ironic that it is the record that everyone considers as the most solid band, uh, Vapid, Panic, Me and Ben, working as a four-piece. But it also was the beginning of the end of that, uh, that idea. It became more of uh, Ben's project. Uh, and what I want to say is uh, the, near the ending of that tour, we were with the Queers, and we had a show in L.A., uh, and I had failed in that I let this fella get away with not sending back the contract. Um, but we had never played in L.A., and I kind of wanted to do it. And this is where uh, sometimes I would go against Ben and not be able to face him, so doing it sort of uh, passive-aggressively without letting him know. Uh, and it all backfired. We got to the... Uh, the location, and the, he didn't see any flyers up. Ben didn't see any flyers up. There was no one there. The promoter wasn't there right away, uh, and he just wanted to leave. He's like, this is shit. They're not going to have it, because he walked into the place, didn't see monitors around. Um, I don't even think we even talked to anybody. He just was adamant about those rules, and if it wasn't there immediately, he was out of there. Because um, I think he didn't, he didn't really think playing live was... Uh, a big part of being a band as, as, as I did. And so I think it, it was easier for him to just make those black and white decisions. Um, so he went to back to the van and I fought with him about, I go, I think we should do this. I think we should wait it out. I think we should, we should just give him the doubt, maybe hit the stage and let the audience know. Um, uh, at that time where there was a, a few punks hanging around there, I didn't know. I'll tell you what happened later. Um, but right then, I was like, we should just do the show. Say what you want about the the poor uh, organization of this show. Let the punks know and let them figure out a way to rebuild their scene, you know, or, or try to put someone else uh, in charge that would not piss off the bands like that. Uh, but he was, no, adamant against it. Um and then we had a big argument in the van where the queers got really quiet. Richard got really quiet. Uh, and then Ben and I went at it. And then um, somehow it led into calling uh, Panic a, a monkey, uh, like a trained slave, and that everyone was disposable. Um, and really, in my mind, it really still sticks out as like, wow, this was the beginning of the end. I think I might even have felt it then. You know, I didn't know uh, that, you know, Vapid would leave later and then Panic sort of got less involved with me and Ben and just seemed to come in to record and then went off to live his life more. So that seemed to be heading towards an end also. Uh, and Panic and Ben didn't really ever really get along too well, I think, at that at that point, definitely. Um, and then uh, Joe also confided to me that Ben had said before that band members are all disposable as long as Jughead was in the band. And that was true for many, 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 many years. And we, he would say that to me, and uh, it, I believed it to be true. And later on, if I make it to the last records, I will talk more about that idea and how that sort of sparked our confrontation with each other. And the last uh, statement that I wrote about the breakup of the band and the, the reforming of The Weasel Without Me, um, but I think it really is traced back to this this moment and why it was also our last tour. Uh, I think it was our last tour. I could be wrong about that. We might have had a little tour after that. I can't remember if this was a tour where we also had a run-in with my friend Matt Nelson, who uh, booked shows for us in Chicago. I'm a little foggy on, on those two. I think that was the last time we played on tour, but I, I think this is, was our last tour. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and that's it. That's all I'll say is, um, it was, it ended up a pretty hard tour. It was a lot, it was a great tour along the way. Uh, it was fun to work with, uh, to, to tour with Ben Hamper and the Queers. Um, let's see what Vapid has to say here. Oh, he just says, I just had the music without lyrics. Uh, so he created all the music, Vapid created the music for Trance, and the I-E-I-E parts, uh, and the chorus, Ben did the rest, so...
I think uh, Vapid, you know, sometimes just wants to keep these things sort of short. I don't think he likes to relive this stuff as much as, as I tend to reflect on it. Um, so that's, that's that. There was more things I wanted to say about being on the road. Um, but you can do some reading. There's a Ben Hamper article that I have posted on Facebook, and I'll maybe I'll post it on the comments on this YouTube so you can uh, look at his experience touring with us. Um, and I'm sure there's tour diaries of both Ben and Joe Queer about that tour also. Uh, so thanks, everybody. This was Anthem for a New Tomorrow, and that was, that was um, over an hour, right? That was an hour and 15 minutes, the longest one yet. So thank you and good night to you.